Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, the, the topic that we're considering, the dead unconscious till the day of resurrection, um, obviously can be quite a, a sobering topic to consider, but hopefully what we'll find as we go through that there's actually um, quite a bit of positive aspects to this and a, a wonderful message of hope for us as well. And um, to begin, we'll kind of consider the fact that, well, if we make the statement that the dead are unconscious until the day of resurrection, it very well must mean that therefore the popular belief of going to heaven or going to hell when you die is therefore false. Um, and so we'll be considering that as well. And throughout the, the class that we're looking at today is going to be going through and considering what scripture has to say on the matter um, and determining, looking at various passages, and we're going to be going through throughout the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, considering all the passages um, that, uh, that clearly state that there is no consciousness in our death. In fact, it's a state of sleep, as we'll see. And so our outline for the class today is uh, considering these various bullet points, looking at our consciousness, how it depends on the body, how death is likened to sleeping, how does scripture describe the state of death, what happened to people of faith when they died. So we have numerous people, obviously, throughout the, the, the word of God, who is mentioned as they, them dying. What happened to them when they died? Looking at the aspect of our believers, have the hope of a physical bodily resurrection. And we'll see that, how, how extensively that uh, language occurs in scripture as well. And also obviously tying into that, um, that secondary point about, well, if there's uh, no kind of consciousness in the grave, then therefore we don't go to heaven or go to hell when we die. Um, the inheritance of the righteous is actually on earth. And uh, there's everlasting destruction of the unrighteous, not a uh, eternal torment in hell or something like that as, as many would profess. So that's the kind of the outline of what we'll be looking to consider today. So the first portion that we'd like to consider is that of the, the need that our body is really the only way in which we have consciousness. Our consciousness fully depends on the fact that, that our body is living and operating properly. So as an example, if I were to have some type of head trauma or some aspect of my body was not working properly, I could go into a coma or I might be laid up in the hospital. And if I was unconscious, you, you, you literally have no thoughts. There are no thoughts going through your mind. Um, and it is, there is nothingness. So we, we know within our, our very various aspect of life that, you know, when, when you think of uh, death, it, it means the opposite of life. So when we say that someone's died, we don't mean that they have now gone on to some other life or, or to some other place. It's very clear that death means the cessation of life, the ending of life. Whereas when someone is born, when, when you have new life brought in, that is the beginning of their life. And so to say that death is really some new beginning would be kind of the opposite of, of really what the word entails and how we use it in, in, in everyday life. And this is something we actually experience each and every day. So we experience this, this unconsciousness, what, it, what, it, what that death-like state would be. Every single day, young or old, we experience what it's like. So when we go to sleep every night, or some people in the day, depending on the job, um, and, when, and when we wake up, we're actually experiencing what it's like to, to perish, to be dead. And um, as we know, as you fall asleep, the next time you wake up, many, much time has passed, hopefully, <laughs> and, uh, and then from there, we, we know that we are now conscious again. We have no idea of what, what took place during that time when, when our, our body was basically dormant, and, um, and, and time was just passing without any of our knowledge. So we had no emotions, there was no feelings, there was just simply a time period that took place and we were asleep. And in fact, if, if anyone has ever been under full anesthetic before, um, I, I did so recently having my wisdom teeth out, and um, you remember quite vividly, vividly going, laying down and they, they put the, you know, the IV in you, and all of a sudden you, you become drowsy and you go to sleep and you know, some, some significant amount of time had taken place since then. And all of a sudden I wake up and I'm, and I'm, I'm in the car basically, this is my, next ver my next memory. There's no aspect of my, kind of my, my soul or my spirit, my true spirit being, being, being cognizant of what was taking place at that time. Because my, my body was inhibited, I was unable to, to consciously see what was going on around me during that time frame or feel or, or do anything. And so each of us has experienced what it is, to, what, it, what it would feel like to be dead. And so we, we, know what, we know what that lack of consciousness is like. And in fact, what we find in Scripture is the same exact type of language is used. 
And so it's, it's very fitting, actually, that the Word of God uses that exact type of language because that is, in fact, what that state is like. So as you look at various passages, um, we're just going to look at a few of them here, but we're going to look at many more as, as we go along. You'll see how this theme of sleeping pops up over and over again. Here we're just going to look, look at just a couple of them. Um, but we find that this particular language is used. And so when you think of that idea of our own experience of what it means to sleep, there's no consciousness at all. Here's how Scripture portrays how death is like sleeping. Okay, so this is the Word of God telling us exactly how it is. So in John chapter 11, verses 11 to 14, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then, has, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. So if they're thinking, well, he's, just, he's sleeping, that's fine. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his death. So very clearly there, the Lord Jesus Christ likens death to a state of sleep. But they thought he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Okay, so very plainly there, he's using very plain language. There's no way to, to, to mistake the language that's being used here. Lazarus was dead, and it was as a state of sleep. Again, we, we all know what that state of sleep is like. Another passage here in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60 regarding the death of Stephen, a very faithful follower of Christ, says, And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. This is him being stoned and him being stoned to death. He, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So he died. That's what, that's what happened to him. And so the language there is being used is he fell asleep. There was no more consciousness in his body. His body was dead. That was it for Stephen at that time. He was asleep. And then the last uh, brief example look at here, just focusing on this particular um, language of, of sleep being used in Scripture. Again, we'll see many more verses as we go through. Uh, regarding Rehoboam, it says, Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. So that's in 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 31. Now, what's really interesting is you will see that language, slept with his fathers, recurs over and over and over again throughout the record of the Kings. So it's almost like a repeating thing when someone dies, says that they slept with their fathers. So that is a, a continual theme that happens not just in some of these passages, but all throughout the record of the kings. When they die, they're buried with their fathers in, the, in, in a particular place, and it says that they slept with them. So again, that is the state of death. Now, going a little bit further, how does Scripture actually describe the state of death? So we already kind of mentioned the fact that as we go to sleep each night and, we, and we've experienced that, we know it's a state of unconsciousness. So there's no... Um, there's no faculties in our mind that are working. We can't, we can't cognitively, cognitively do things and think things and feel things. So what we'll consider now are a number of various passages that describe exactly what the state of death is like. So first we'll look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. It says, this is Solomon speaking, who is probably second to Christ. He was given the greatest wisdom and knowledge of, of any man that lived on the face of the earth. And here at the end of his life, he's recounting back upon his life. Um, you know, obviously, at the beginning of his reign as, as, as king, he did very well. But then near the end of his life, he, he made great mistakes. And he's now reflecting on all the futility of mankind and the futility of, of um, the pursuits of men and in, in our, in our kind of fleshly desires. And so here, him recounting here in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, he says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So again, there's no ambiguity in this language. It's very clear what he's saying. When you go into the grave, you don't have any of those things. There's no working. There's no knowledge. There's no wisdom. None of those things exist. You're unconscious. Psalm 88, we'll look at verse 5 and then verses 10 to 12. The psalmist says, Free from among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? So here, these questions are being asked, and obviously those things cannot be done in the grave. So these are basically rhetorical questions. The dead cannot arise and praise God in the grave. His loving kindness cannot be declared 
when one's dead. So all these things are, are again, very easy to understand language to show that that's, that's the state when we die, when we, as a language, figurative language says, go to sleep. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, back to Ecclesiastes again, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. So none who go down into the grave would, uh, would pray, can praise the Lord. Psalm 39, verses 5, and then uh, verses 12 to, 12, 12 to 13, Behold, thou hast made my days as in handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thou, excuse me, hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. No more existence. Okay? At the end of his life, at the end of, when we die, there is no more existence after that. And then finally, a, a couple last ones. So as you can see, we're going through many various passages here that are all saying the same thing. Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. No more emotions. So if we had this idea of some immortal spirit that's living inside us, that's really the true personality and entity of who we are, well, this is saying that no, once, once our body perishes, once there's no more life in our body, all those feelings and emotions that we experience now in our consciousness and with, the, with these bodies that we have, those things are perished, they're done. None of that exists once we die. Neither have they any more portion for anything that is done under the sun. And finally, Psalm 146, verses 2 to 4. While I live, will I praise Yahweh. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. So that's when we can praise God. While we live, while we have life, while we have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. Again, reiterating the same points. And in fact, that last, that last verse there, his breath goeth forth, no more breath in your body. Therefore, what happens? Your body decays, it returns into the earth. It's very natural, and fact, that's exactly what Genesis chapter 2 says when God created man. He created him of the dust of the earth, he was given the breath of life, and therefore he was a living being. This verse is saying the exact opposite. So once there's no longer breath in us, then we return to the earth, and there's no more thoughts. There's no more consciousness within us. Now, if we were to uh, kind of stop right there and say, okay, that's, okay, we've made our point. There's, there's no consciousness in death. Well, that, that would be kind of a, a depressing, uh, depressing thing to consider. You know, what else then? Do we just kind of live out our lives however we'd like? In fact, um, if we could turn into our Bibles in 1 Corinthians 15, um, Paul actually, uh, the Apostle Paul spends quite a bit of time actually focusing on the resurrection in this particular chapter in, uh, in, our, in our Bibles. And he actually brings out that very point of the necessity for the resurrection. And so he, he actually brings out that if we don't believe in the resurrection, if we don't believe that, that, um, that we can be raised from the dead, that God can raise us, then, in fact, we would have a very similar view to, say, atheists, people who have no belief in God. They would agree with every single thing we've just said. When we die, we're like the animals. We have no consciousness. You just enjoy your life as is, and we're just like the, like the beasts that perish, and, and, and we die. And, and for them, that's the end. But what God tells us is, is that's not the end. In verse 32... Paul says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage, advantage is it if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So that's very much the thinking we would have if we just stopped right there and said, okay, well, if there's no consciousness in death, I'm just going to enjoy my life to the fullest and do everything I'd like to do. Whatever pleases me, I will do that. And, you know, in the end I'll die, and that's it. There's no more, no more knowledge. There's nothing else after that. But Paul is contending in 1 Corinthians 15 that there must be a resurrection. He makes very specific points as to why there must be a resurrection. Again, we want to make the point that, that the language that, we're, that we are considering is very straightforward and unambiguous. So it's important that we, when we're looking to establish scriptural principles and interpretations, that plain testimony should guide us in understanding um, those things that, that might appear to be obscure. 
So uh, fundamental principles should be gathered from, um, from those passages that are easy to be understood. So when we look at what happened with, say, Joseph as an example, what does Scripture say about what happened to him when he died? So in Genesis chapter 15, verse 26, we're told that Joseph died. He was 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. That's how the, the record of Genesis ends. Those are the last words. He was put in a coffin in Egypt. It doesn't say anything about him going to heaven or to a better place or going to, say, a, uh, a temporary holding place until the resurrection or anything like that. Uh, where his spirit would go, he died. As we saw before, it's a state of sleep. He died, 110 years old, he was embalmed, he was put in a coffin. In fact, Joseph made a particular uh, point of saying he wanted his body buried in a very particular place. He didn't want to be buried in the land of Egypt. His body, he wanted it to be buried in the land of promise. And so that's going to tell us something as we we move along about the body. It's It's a bodily resurrection that's going to be talked about. Same thing with Moses, Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 and 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So again, the focus there is he was buried, he died, he was buried in a certain place, nothing else regarding some spirit going somewhere else or any other consciousness. In fact, what we find is many other occurrences, same for Joshua, Samuel, David, Solomon, again, all those kings that are listed throughout all the kings, all the same thing is mentioned. They died, they slept with their fathers, they were buried. That is the outcome. But what we do know, again, is that they do, they did have a hope. So they all died with a particular hope. These, these faithful men and women of faith that we read about throughout the Bible died with a hope. And we're told about that hope in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. It mentions all these various faithful and their faithful acts that they performed throughout their life, how they were motivated in their life by their faith to follow and walk in God's ways. And we're told that they all died in faith, not having received the promises. And that's linking back to the promises made to Abraham back in Genesis. However, they saw them afar off. So they did not receive any immediate reward when they died. In fact, they're all sleeping in the dust of the earth. There is no consciousness in them. They are awaiting a particular day. And that's the day that, that Paul is alluding to when we looked at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, if we can turn back there now. 1 Corinthians 15, he spends quite a bit of time focusing on how important it is that we actually have a resurrection, a bodily resurrection, and it all ties to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we read 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 16, um, obviously there's a lot more we can read there for context, but we'll just, for the sake of... Uh, of trying to capture some of these key points here. We'll just focus on this section. Paul says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So right off the bat there, you see he's making a very very succinct point, basically saying, well, if there is no resurrection, well then, that means that Christ was never raised in the first place. And if he was never raised from the dead... And basically, what was the purpose of our faith? Our faith is useless. He must be risen from the dead. And in fact, that was the job of the apostles. They were, they were going, going and spreading the gospel and, and sharing the witnessing that this, this man, this son of God, was raised from the dead. They saw him with their own eyes. If we keep reading, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that slept. Again, you can see underlined there how the idea of sleeping comes up again, likened to death. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ. At his coming. So he's making several points in here that, we, that are worth pointing out. The first is, again, he's focusing on the idea of a physical resurrection, the resurrection of the body. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was raised from the dead, was not a spirit floating around. He had a physical body. They could see his body. They could see the, the, the nails that were in his hands and his feet. He was a physical being, and he ascended to heaven as a physical being. Likewise for us, if we are going to be following in in the same example of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a resurrection of our physical bodies, and that's what what Paul is pointing to here. 
Again, he makes the point that our faith is worthless without resurrection. There's no point in believing in, 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 in anything pertaining to God, really, if, if, if we can't be raised from the dead as, as in Christ. Because okay? otherwise we are, we are simply destined to end up in the ground. So there must be some raising from the, from the grave. And in fact, that is the faith of Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 22, he shows that very faith when he seeks to offer up his own son Isaac, believing that God was able to raise him from the dead, even though he had never seen such a thing on the earth at that time. He also makes the point that without resurrection, anticipation of death is miserable. So later in the chapter, he says, well, you could just eat and drink and be merry. So that's one, that could be one response. Alternative to that is what I mentioned earlier. Well, it could be quite depressing. Well, all we have to look forward to is just this, this state of nothingness, and that's, that's all there is for us. That's all God has prepared for us. We live, we die, and that's it. Well, then, what a, what a miserable state that we're in. He states that all people go to the grave, and they remain there after, that, after death. He says that Christ went to the grave, as have all men, but he is the first that has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of them that slept. And he makes a point that the dead in Christ, they sleep in the dust until a certain time. Notice there at the end, at the very last verse there in verse 23, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, he's already been risen. This is written at the time after his resurrection. He's already been risen. He's the first fruits. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming, when he comes. So we're told, we're expecting now, at some point he's going to be coming back from heaven. And we're told that in Acts chapter 1, that he would be re returning to the earth in the same way in which he went. So he's going to be coming back to the earth. And at his coming, he's going to bring, bring, uh, bring to life again those who are dead in Christ, those who are sleeping in Christ. And they'll be resurrected bodily as he was. And finally, all other dead will remain unconscious in the grave. And so that's what he, he's alluding to back earlier. Where he says, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So there's some who will be remaining in the ground. And so if we, don't, if we didn't have, uh, if the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't raised, then we wouldn't have that hope of, of resurrection. Now what's interesting as we go on from there, as we show that there's, there's, there's additional aspects to this kind of uh, this process of death and then resurrection and then what, what, what comes next. We can't just be resurrected and then what, what happens afterwards. And so what we see is there's actually a process of death, resurrection, judgment, and then a seat of either immortality or destruction after the judgment seat. So some of the passages we'll consider here for this is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. We're just looking at one little section of that, but um, it is also a very comforting uh, passage. Paul speaking to the Thessalonians who were receiving great per persecution at that time for their beliefs. And he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Again, the same language that we've seen used throughout. So this is Old Testament, New Testament. All this is consistent. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So those which have no hope would truly fear sorrow because the end is just simply laying, laying, down to uh, laying down to rest in the ground. No consciousness, that's the end. However, however, those who are in Christ do not sorrow as those who have no hope. We have a hope, the hope of the resurrection that we just looked at in 1 Corinthians 15. Daniel chapter 12 speaks of the same thing. Again, those who sleep. So it says, and many of them, not all, but many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's the aspect of the judgment seat. So many of them who are sleeping in the dust are going to be raised, and then they're going to be facing the judgment seat. And then finally, in um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, this, this entire section here is probably one of my favorite, favorite sections of Scripture. Paul here is at the end of his life. He's gone through great trials um, for, for the sake of, of the gospel. And here he's writing this last letter to, to a, 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 um, a trusted friend in Timothy and someone who's gone through a lot of these trials with him. And here is a, is a message not only for Timothy, but for us. You consider this message of this wise, this wise older um, man who was a follower of Christ, who diligently sought his ways in, in all things, and here, here is his, his charge here at the end of his life here. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing 
and his kingdom. So it's very important to, to highlight that aspect there, his appearing and his kingdom. So when will that happen? When will this judgment that we're focusing on here happen? At his appearing and kingdom. Okay, at his coming is, is how, how Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. So it's a very specific time when that's going to happen. He goes on to say, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That language he's using there is that of he's expecting his death. He actually used that language earlier in Acts chapter 20 when he was going to Jerusalem, and he actually thought he was going to die at that time. This time he actually is going to die, and he knows that. And uh, he's, he's here in, in, um, in chains in Rome, and he, he will shortly be, be killed by the, by the Romans. And so here he's, he's going to be laid down to sleep. He likewise will, will cease to exist. But here's his hope. Here's our hope. Here's the hope that, that's been in, that we've been invited to. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Which day? His appearing and his kingdom. And Christ comes back at his appearing and his kingdom. And he goes on to say, not to me only, I'm not the only one that's going to receive this crown, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So those are the, those who, in Christ who will receive life eternal. Those who, are, who will be raised, who, who will awake, who will be judged, some to everlasting life, there will be others who are judged to everlasting contempt or destruction. And so it really is a um, kind of a, a wonderful link here that you have between his uh, at, at that day, the appearing, loving the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his appearing in kingdom. So all these things are linked in, in that passage in, in, uh, in Timothy of a particular day in which this will occur. And it's going to be when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. So it's not something that's happened already. It's something yet to come. And Paul was in anticipation of that day. And his very next waking moment, from, from what we know in Scripture, he went to sleep, he's in the dust of the earth, no more consciousness, but when his physical body is resurrected, it'll be like a, like a moment, like a twinkling of an eye, and he will then be awake, and he'll be before the judgment seat of Christ um, to hopefully receive that crown of righteousness if judge worthy. So shifting gears a little bit, so we, we consider the aspect, well, Many believe that, well, if you, when, when you die, if there is this immortal soul, it has to go somewhere. And so many, when, when considering the various passages in Scripture that talk about the kingdom of heaven, they, they kind of consider those words and actually change them a little bit and think of the kingdom in heaven. But that's not actually what, what's being taught throughout those various passages. And what we'll see is that the inheritance of the righteous is actually on earth. It's not in heaven. We don't receive it immediately after we die. We've seen the necessity in how those faithful hoped in a resurrection, a bodily resurrection. And so that's something, that's something yet to come. And so if we died today, we are not whisked away into heaven. In fact, what we're told throughout Scripture, and we're just going to look at a handful of verses, and there's, there's quite a few, but you could, you could fill pages of all the verses that talk about how the inheritance of the righteous is on earth. It's not something that we're whisked away to in heaven after we die. So the first, first consideration is Proverbs chapter 11, verse 31. Behold, the righteous will be rewarded in the earth. It doesn't say in heaven. In the earth will they be rewarded. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, Christ's Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So that is their inheritance. And that language of inheritance or reward, those things tie back all the way to the promises made to Abraham. That's what we looked at in Hebrews chapter 11. So all that ties back to those promises. That's the inheritance that is being talked about here, inheriting the earth. Because God's overall purpose is to bring about a people who would be in his image and likeness. They would show forth his wonderful character throughout this entire earth. And that's what this whole process is about. And that's the necessity for resurrection. Even though we're cursed to the ground to die in Adam, we can be made alive in Christ if we follow in that way that he's provided in his son. Uh, Psalms 37 Verses 9 to 11 says, Evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt dil diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. What well, that means, they will cease to exist. The wicked, the unrighteous, will cease to exist. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. There will be an earth filled with righteousness 
and peace in that age, in that kingdom to come at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ when He sets up God's kingdom on this earth. Psalm 2, verse 8, which is a, a messianic psalm, speaking of the time when Christ will be set up on His throne in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. It says, I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So it is something be, that will be possessed. It will be the, the kingdom of, of God and Christ will be in possession of that, ruling over it. A few more verses to consider just to kind of f- further lay out these, uh, these themes. Again, we go all the way to the end of Scripture, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Here, these are the saints speaking. These are the righteous who are wearing robes of white. They're saying, Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made unto us our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So that's the place where the saints will reign. Not in heaven, Though the, the, the Bible does talk about them reigning in the heavenly places, which in many cases, if you look, it actually talks about rulership positions versus the people that are ruled over when it talks about the heavens and the earth. In this case here, it's very specific. They will be reigning on the earth. That's where the inheritance is. That's where the, um, that's where the kingdom will be. Revelation 11, verse 15, the same thing. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So there's the same thing. The kingdoms you see in this world will be subdued. They'll be cast down and be replaced by the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Daniel chapter 2, that entire vision there of Nebuchadnezzar's image and the striking of the feet and and the grinding to powder the entire image is all foreshadowing that idea of, of the Lord Jesus Christ coming and subduing the kingdoms of this world. And then that stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, would fill the entire earth. It will all be his dominion. And finally, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27, going back to the Old Testament again. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So again, there's people who are being ruled over in that age, and the saints are called with the Lord Jesus Christ to reign as kings and priests over the earth. So again, very specific language here pointing to the fact that all things are about coming to the earth, not, not us ascending to heaven for any reason, these spiritual bodies ascending to heaven. All the language that we're seeing here is very specific about is, a, is a God's purpose with the earth is, um, is, that, is that it might be subdued and, and reigned over by the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the saints, and that his glory, his righteousness might be declared in the earth. And the last consideration that we'll look at is, uh, again, we're looking at the judgment seat. Uh, so if the inheritance of the righteous is the earth, well then, what we find for those who are unrighteous is a, a state of everlasting destruction. Um, again, what's, what's proposed by many is that there's actually a state of eternal torment because if you have these, these immortal souls kind of floating around, they have to go somewhere. And so, well, if the righteous go to heaven, this place of, you know, you just kind of imagine, I guess, because the scripture doesn't actually describe exactly what that place would be like because it's not there. Um, but instead of this place of, of ultimate uh, you know, pleasure for, for all eternity, they say, well, the, the wicked must go to a place of eternal torment then. And so what we find is Scripture does not say that. It does not say that God seeks to eternally torment people for, forever. Uh, that's just not the case. What we find is that it simply says that they will perish. They will be left unconscious for all time. They will return to the dust. And that is the end. In Psalm 37, verse 20, it says that the wicked shall perish. It's an end. There's an end to them. Romans 8, verse 13, If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. We know the passages that talk about the wages of sin is death. So if that's the case, that is the end result. So that is, that is what we're paid. If we choose to live our life following after what our, what our own fleshly desires are, what we, what we would seek to do, instead of following the ways of God, following the, the path that's been laid before us in the Lord Jesus Christ, well then, we, we end up dead without the hope of resurrection. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You notice there's not eternal torment, it's everlasting destruction, meaning the destruction lasts forever. So there's, there's, no, there's no forming those individuals again. They are gone forever. No more consciousness. 
Proverbs chapter 2, verses 21 to 22. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. That goes right back to what we just looked at, right? The inheritance of the righteous is the earth. The wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. They do not inherit the earth. They'll be cut off from the earth. They will not be remembered anymore. They will no longer exist. They will be in the ground, no consciousness. Not, they will not be going to a place of eternal torment. Finally, a few last passages on this particular topic. As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. So again, they cease to exist. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 20. The wicked shall perish. The enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume. Into smoke shall they consume away. So just like smoke, it, it goes away and eventually it's no longer there anymore, right? It dissipates and it no longer exists. In Isaiah 24, verse 14, it says, They are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. So very specifically, there are those who shall not rise. They will be cast in the dust of the earth and will not rise. Therefore, hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. So again, that is what the Bible speaks of, of everlasting destruction, not eternal torment forever to where you're always feeling this pain or something like, like, the, uh, um, like, like many would have you believe of, of this, 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 this horrible you know, way of torturing someone for all eternity because of, because of their sins. That's not at all what, what, uh, what the Bible says. It says here you will, you will simply be in everlasting destruction. You exist no more. So having considered all those various aspects, so I, I thought Romans chapter 8 um, is, is a kind of a fantastic passage to turn to, um, which maybe helps to kind of um, show, show really what our hope is, because we can look around us today, and, and all of us have experienced death in some form in our lives. Um, and what we do know is that God is progressing this world towards something much greater than what we see around us currently today. So we can't be downtrodden because we know of our nature, because if we, if we, if we die, there's no, there's no more consciousness. What we are told is there's a wonderful hope that, we were, that we've been invited to. God wants to see us succeed. He wants to see us to be a part of his kingdom, to be those who are raised in Christ, to be like Christ, and, and to be a people for his name. He wants that. He doesn't want to see us left in the dust of the earth. That's not what he wants. And so he's actually calling us to that wonderful hope. That's what his word does. And so Romans chapter 8 is, is, for me, a wonderful reminder of that, of the current things that we see. Everything is, is pointing forward to something much greater. So Romans 8, verse 18, again, it's difficult to just kind of jump into a particular section for the context, but um, we'll, we'll just kind of um, start in verse 18 through 23 just to try and summarize these points here. So Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. That's the revealing of the saints, those people who are going to rule over the earth and subdue it and make it a place of righteousness and peace again. You can look around now and it's a, it's a world full of corruption and death and violence. That's what all of creation is waiting for. Not just people, but, but the actual creation, the plants, the animals, the way, the way that God created things. He goes on to say that. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's what we look forward to. We can't wait to see that day. The creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption that we see around us. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan as well. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Our body. To be changed. If, you re if we continued reading in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the changing of our bodies from a body that is, that is mortal into a body that is immortal, from a moral state that is corruptible into a moral state, or to a moral state that is incorruptible. He goes on to speak of that. We cannot wait for the changing of our body, the redemption of our body, 
So all creation is longing to see that day, that day occur. And God is inviting every single person on this earth to that. If we would only hear him and seek to follow his way instead of our own. And, and lay hold on the salvation provided in his son. So that is the, the conclusion of our talk tonight. I'd like to just leave up on the slide. Uh, the last slide here is just a summary of uh, kind of what we considered tonight. Obviously all the different points here regarding the uh, uh, kind of our outline of what we covered. Um, how our consciousness depends on the body. We can see that from, from the natural way in which we, we oh, go to sleep and wake up every single day. And we experience what that, how, how it does depend on the body. And then all the various passages in scripture, how death is likened to sleeping. How there's no love or hatred or emotions or thinking in death. All the passages that talked about that, again, without any ambigu ambiguity. How people of faith simply went to the grave when they died. They didn't go anywhere else. They slept in the dust of the earth. And yet they had a hope of resurrection to receive an immortal physical body and a body that would not be prone to sin, one that would not be, that would not be seeking um, one's own selfish desires first. And then finally, how the everlasting inheritance of the righteous is on the earth, not in heaven, and how the death of the unrighteous are destroyed forever without any consciousness instead of the eternal torment that can be uh, popularly uh, presented throughout Christendom today. Mm -hmm.